joining us today for the Urban Water Innovation Systems webinar. We're excited to kick off the Thrust C series today with a presentation on governance and adoption of sustainable urban water policies from Dr. Gary Paivo at the University of Arizona. Make sure all my controls are working here. So Thrust C explores how cities can intentionally foster the widespread adoption of infrastructure, development patterns, consumer behaviors, and management practices that advance sustainable water management. To understand overcoming barriers to adoption of sustainable solutions, the social and behavioral systems that govern change are investigated under this research thrust. Our webinar schedule is posted to the UN calendar, which can be accessed from the main menu of our website. We'll continue to record each webinar and post to our YouTube channel, and as always, a link to the video will be distributed as soon as it's available. Our participants have entered this webinar muted, so please enter your questions into the chat queue and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Next week we're going to switch gears a little bit with a presentation from the Thrust D team at Oregon State University. Dr. Mary Sampleman will be discussing her team's multi-scale approach to design and evaluation of innovation in urban water systems to promote best practices in the appropriate context. And with that, I am excited to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Gary Paivo, Deputy Director of UN. He is a professor of urban planning and natural resources at the University of Arizona, where he teaches and studies water policy, socially responsible property investing, and sustainable cities. Dr. Paivo has an extensive history of public engagement, including co-founding the UN Environment Program Property Working Group, 1,000 Friends of Washington, and the Urban Land Institute Responsible Property Investing Council. He has served on committees for the World Green Building Council and the Global Reporting Initiative and has consulted for Fannie Mae, the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Economic Development Administration, and other public agencies. His paper, Income, Value, and Returns in Socially Responsible Office Properties, won the American Real Estate Society's Legacy Award. And with that, we're going to turn over the controls to Gary in Arizona, so bear with us for just a second while we get that switched over. All right, Gary, I can see your screen and I know we can hear you, so I'm going to mute myself and let you take over. <laughs> okay, Sarah, I love your... Uh your radio voice, that's just so, so lovely. Um, okay, well, hello. Um, I happen to have peaked, and I know that uh, Jesse's out there, and Neil's out there, and uh, I'm sure all of my children and family are out there. So, hello, and um, welcome to the, to the talk. This is um, a new presentation that I've um, put together in order to um, uh, give an overview of what we're up to for in this area for today's webinar um, and um, and I'm pleased to have this opportunity I am uh, presenting obviously but I'm also using materials that have been shared with me by my colleague um, Professor Henry at the U of A and so He's here on the home screen as well. Um, I'd also like to say that um, a lot of this work has been done in collaboration with others. And so there's Emily Bell and Edna Gomez, who are PhD students at the U of A, um, Drew Sanderford and Andrea Gerlach, who are professors in geography and urban planning here at the U of A, Tom Meissner, often shares interesting, insightful comments, uh, professor of hydrology. Um, Neil and Neil Grigg and, and Jessica Bolson at Florida and at Colorado are also often frequent discussants with us on these issues, and I thank them for their contributions as well. And so, um, uh, uh, it's this is certainly a collaborative effort. So, I'm going to explore these um, these topics. Um, as we broadly try to understand policy adoption. The first is, what kind of science is needed to enhance urban water sustainability? I want to put the, this conversation into context um, 
with um, the broader interdisciplinary initiative that UN really is. Um, secondly, I want to explore what does social science have to offer. And by social science, <clears throat> I'm drawing that broadly. Uh, that would include the economic sciences, the behavioral sciences, the policy sciences, um, and uh, other things that might fit under there, social science broadly. Third, what policies are being adopted? Um, what do we know um, about the, um, the pattern, geography, frequency, distribution of policies that have been adopted? Fourth, how do um, theories, pre-existing theories, and there's some very interesting ones, about the policy adoption and policy change process compare to uh, some of the empirical research that um, has been done on um, uh, what's being done in water and, and what it might explain it. And then finally, what is this inspiring us to do with respect to new research? Um, and how are we approaching it? Okay. So first of all, with respect to the kind of science needed to enhance water um, uh, sustainability, um, broadly, uh, there are a lot of uh, scientific questions under the, needed in order to address the large goal of improving the environmental performance, the resilience, or the social equity of water supply, wastewater, and stormwater systems. In other words, environmental performance, resilience, and social equity are um, three important dimensions of sustainability um, that frequently come up in the conversation. And also, obviously, when we say urban water, we're dealing with these multiple systems, and then some, no doubt. Um, a central puzzle that comes up is what is technically possible often outpaces what we actually do as a society. Um, we know how to how to uh, do a lot more with respect to water conservation or water um, solutions um, or land conservation and uh, so forth then perhaps we actually inf implement. Why is that? This is not the only um, uh, policy issue in which that happens. Um, uh, I was at a meeting this last weekend at um, Chapel Hill with people from the Department of Energy talking about uh, the innovations in energy efficiency in, um, in buildings and um, with a number of economists um, who knew quite a lot about um, what was economically efficient but it was, dis it was ob observed that uh, people aren't always doing the most economically efficient thing. So why, what explains these gaps? Um, so consider an example that highlights this complexity um, which uh, in, uh, to illustrate this, how do we reduce outdoor non-essential water use in a semi-arid urban environment like Tucson. Well, T Tucson performs very well relative to Arizona. As you can see, um, the orange line is Tucson's uh, gallons per capita per day. Um, and the blue, uh, since 1985, and you can see the decline compared to uh, the blue line, which is um, uh, Arizona as a whole, which has um, been relatively flat. Uh, surprisingly, and um, significantly higher uh, than Tucson. Um, uh, and it's also interesting to note that the green line, the U.S., um, is, um, is below both. Um, you would think that, uh, Tucson, that Arizona, being an arid state, um, would be below uh, the U.S. if you thought that um, aridity motivated conservation, but it doesn't appear to be that simple. Um, so how can we get much better? Um, well, one of the ways to do that is to reduce the use of piped water for irrigation. How much better? Well, 45% of the use represented in the orange line is for outdoor use. So if we can reduce the use of piped water for irrigation, we may be able to um, um, uh, reduce that, um, that uh, orange line by another 20, 30, 40, even uh, 50%. Um, there are a lot of potential solutions. One of those uh, in the green infrastructure category is rainwater harvesting. Um, in order to um, implement rainwater harvesting, which is uh, we could consider behavioral educational solutions like um, giving water audits like is done in Tucson. Um, we can consider uh, market and pricing solutions which might um, make it more economically attractive for households to um, um, get free water from the sky, um, as is indicated by um, the article in the Sentinel, which shows that 
indeed our water rates are lower than Phoenix's and that does seem to explain uh, less water use here. Um, we can focus also on talking about it as a technical solution as this um, quick guide from the Arizona Cooperative Extension um, would suggest. Um, in this general question or in this general issue of how might we implement rainwater harvesting in order to conserve, uh, reduce out uh, the use of piped water for irrigation, there are a number of questions that come up that are um, from the variety of sciences. What will the hydrological effects be? Does it actually um, reduce uh, flood risk? Can it be argued as a form of flood control or do we um, not expect that to happen? What's the best way to promote it, as I was saying, regulations, incentives, education? What will it do for the behavior of the people in the firms? Will conser conservation lead to higher use? In Tucson, for example, we've found that people who've adopted this don't necessarily reduce their water um, purchases. In some case, um, it might even go up a little bit as they um, uh, install um, additional landscaping um, in order to enjoy and use the free water and then supplement that also with, um, with uh, potable delivered water. What finance structures can pay for these programs? And um, ultimately this shows us that this is just not just an engineering program or problem. So what does social science have to offer us uh, to help us understand um, uh, the urban water problem? So there are a number of pre-existing or existing long-standing in some cases theories about what drives adoption, what, what creates innovation, <clears throat> what motivates policy change. And they all suggest possible explanations um, for, for action. Um, this is uh, Hofferbert's funnel of causality model from the 1970s. So clearly there's a lot of um, material here that goes back um, at least since the beginning of my career. Uh, and <clears throat> as you can see here, it, uh, th this model suggests that there's a funneling of policy options that results in a solution or an adoption that begin with broad historic geographic conditions. It might be things like drought, which are then narrowed further by what can be afforded, the socioeconomic composition of the community, the political attitudes of the community, the institutions, which we might think of here as <clears throat> laws and regulations that make an option available, and then ultimately what Finally, what the elites in this model, those that have the, the ultimate power to make the decisions, say, for example, the city council members, um, think about this. This is the so-called <clears throat> funnel of causality, which is um, not so widely applied recent, lately in the USA, but still widely um, used and written about in, in Europe. Um, in fact, this theory and others um, um, tell us that there are a lot of things that can influence actions by local governments and other levels of governments, things like charismatic personalities or policy entrepreneurs, um, shocks to the system like, um, um, uh, like hazardous events or droughts that create windows of opportunities, the affluence or education levels of folks in the community use socioeconomic factors, um, the political culture um, of, the, uh, uh, of the people involved in this policy system, what they believe is important um, and what they think is a problem and how they think different sorts of solutions may best work. Um, and then also networking, the kind of collaboration and information sharing um, has been observed as a potential driver of what distinguishes one community's approach from another. Um, but we're particularly interested in which of these we can actually influence. Um, it's hard to think about how you might change the political culture of a community, although that is maybe a little, it is amenable to some change through political organizing, um, um, or to change the socioeconomic wealth of a community, um, or even to create shocks to the system. Um, but it is more possible to think about how one might um, train people to be policy entrepreneurs, or facilitate networking and interconnections and cross-network collaboration among different um, um, groups, of uh, uh, networks of folks that are involved in the policy decision. So we, it is worth noting that there's a difference between explanatory variables that one can simply use to predict and others that can be used as policy levers to help the change agent and make a difference 
in, um, in what's going on. So then, um, policies being adopted. Um, let's take a look at what we know. Unfortunately, um, we don't really know enough um, about this. Um, uh, now, when I say policies being adopted, <clears throat> I would say that you can think about um, uh, several different types of um, local or higher level governmental policies that are uh, aimed at um, uh, sustainable water solutions and they come from broader theories of sustainability. Um, the first um, is mitigation um, um, and um, this kind of comes from the tradition of um, impact reduction, um, the, um, the uh, um, kind of uh, environmental forces that need to be impact that are creating a negative footprint that need to be reduced. This is consistent with the idea of reduce, reuse, recycle. Examples of this would be conservation, the use of micro turbines in order to um, uh, capture waste energy and recycle it back into the system. Similarly, water reuse. So various forms of mitigation to reduce uh, the footprint um, that uh, our water supply um, and um, sewage treatment and other water uh, management systems are placing on um, the, uh, the larger environmental system. Then you've got asset preservation. One of the theories of sustainability is that, the, 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 that um, these uh, capital assets, man-made assets, natural assets, as well as social capital, um, are, are what our well-being is built upon and insofar as we can protect and preserve and pass to future generation these assets, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to have a sustainable uh, situation. So source water protection planning, protecting the watersheds, facilities maintenance, protecting the infrastructural systems and investments and capital assets that we have would be examples of asset preservation sorts of sustainability policies in a local community. Um, a third idea is that um, in sustainability, is that for a sustainable urban water system, for example, you don't just need to think about um, that system as putting pressures on the broader environment, but the broader environment putting pressures on that system. And so there might be external shocks that can be disruptive in the forms of floods or fires or something like that. Um, and so this is where the idea of resiliency, can the system, um, uh, is the system resilient to um, uh, these pressures? Real-time, uh, water quality monitoring that might pick up the introduction of an external um, pollutant um, uh, and then um, allow for quick response to address that uh, before too many people um, have health effects, for example, would be an example of a resilience policy, a resiliency policy or disaster planning would be another one of those. Um, equity is a, th is a fourth common principle um, that, one, that one sees in sustainability theories. Um, um, and low-income billing assistance and affordability metrics would be examples of that. And then finally, the, the idea of sustainable development, um, the third leg, if you want, the economic development leg of the three-legged environmental, social, and economic stool of sustainability, uh, means that the system uh, to be recognized as sustainable should be supportive of the economic um, development, um, uh, employment opportunities, um, uh, household wealth and income um, in a community and uh, making sure for example that land uses um, that are planned and service um, service um, um, provision that is planned um, is are, are coordinated or consistent are concurrent um, would be an example of that um, kind of um, focus so when we look at um, when we look for information on what policies are being adopted what we find, is um, you know a, uh, a limited number of, of, of national studies that have um, to, that tell us what's going on in the country. Um, the most comprehensive one I would say is this by Amy Landis, um, who's at Georgia Tech, I believe now, and it's her 2015 survey called the State of Water Wastewater Utility Sustainability, which was done in collaboration with the American Water Works Association. And what you can see here on the left is water utility practices, and on the right, water and wastewater utility practices. 
and below that um, some uh, 20 or so different practices that she drew from the literature on urban sustainability and basically was asking um, whether these were adopted. And um, if you if you look for pattern, what you see first of all is that is that the use ranges from zero percent, um, that is zero percent of the water and wastewater um, utilities are um, using fuel cells to sixty three percent of the um, of these same wastewater and water utilities are monitoring water delivery efficiency. That's the most common form of sustainability practice. You also can see that nearly all the practices are used by um, fewer than by fewer than half um, of the um, of the utilities. Nearly all of them. There's a few that are used by more, but uh, these practices are by no means um, ubiquitous. Although I don't think you'd necessarily expect all of them to be adopted by everybody, but um, it does suggest that there's there's room. Um, and also, it's interesting if you look for decentralized solutions, um, which is of particular interest to a certain um, um, view uh, of how sustainability might be fostered um, in the future, the adoption of or the combination of decentralized systems, naturalistic systems um, with more um, um, piped and uh, engineered and centralized systems, that things like um, rain barrels and green roofs are still in the early adopter stage. Um, here's another uh, interesting um, survey, I think, where out of Vanderbilt we see uh, that they actually looked um, at uh, water conservation in particular um, and created an index that was comprised of uh, questions about 30 or 40 different kinds of things that a community might be doing, um, normalized that and came up with an index score um, uh, called the Vanderbilt Water Conservation Index for these 195 cities. It's a reasonably good indicator, actually. It's been validated by, cor by correlating it with, um, uh, evident with data uh, on conservation practices from the American Water Works Association um, Utility Practices Survey. Um, and um, at any rate, um, you can see that um, the, we can see that um, there's, a, again, a wide range of adoption of these different kinds of practices. You also notice that there's a kind of a clustering um, of some kind of these practices um, that is of communities that are um, a, that are higher scoring more highly on the index in the in the yellows and lighter blues um, and one can ask why this pattern it starts to become a, um, a sort of normal social science question why this pattern why those clusters what's going on um, and um, could it be some form of neighbor to neighbor learning neighbor diffusion um, there certainly seems to be adjacency in this pa in these patterns. Um, could that could it be a regional aridity driver of some kind? That is places that um, you know are more arid um, have it, but then on the other hand, Florida isn't. So that would seem to uh, nor is um, uh, you know North Carolina. Perhaps it has something to do with storage capacity and infrastructural uh, consideration. Anyway, this is um, another kind of um, uh, 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 image, um, source of information about the adoption of sustainability practices. So how do adoption theories compare to empirical um, research? Um, so I want to review five um, established theories of the policy process. Um, <clears throat> the um, first one is called activity coalition framework. And the idea here is that coalitions um, uh, um, as shown here in the policy subsystem, and here the policy subsystem would be the um, local urban water policy subsystem, as it were, um, that those coalitions, or maybe one dominant coalition, drives what happens. Um, and change results from, can result from external events like floods, or internal events like system failures, or policy-oriented learning like forums, um, or negotiations between competing co coalitions that um, allow for some amount of power to shift from the dominant coalition um, or um, which drives some superior jurisdiction to impose change on the uh, dominant coalition on the policy subsystem. So you might see that um, a basic attribute like storage capacity could have an influence 
on what's what's adopted, or um, ecological attitudes in the in public opinion might change, or policy learning might cause the coalitions to change what they believe to be the most effective strategy or cost-effective strategy um, to solve these problems. So that's um, an interesting pre-existing theory that helps us think about what might explain local policy practices and change. Um, a second uh, theory is called the multiple streams policy or multiple streams approach, which has a lot of uh, similarities with the policy entrepreneur approach. The idea here is that a, um, is a policy change occurs when a policy entrepreneur uses a policy window or opportunity, uh, uh, short term of um, short period of time, um, which can open during an extreme political or problem event, um, and to couple that is the entrepreneur would, would, is thought of as is as coupling three streams. We've got the problem streams, such as an environmental disaster or alarms raised by declining indicators. The policy stream, um, which is different kinds of solutions that people have thought might be practical. Um, and the political stream, um, mood swings, pressure group campaigns, administrative and political turnover. The idea is that the policy entrepreneur uses the window of opportunity to pull these three things together, the politics, um, under the fact of the existence of a problem, and policy options to cause change in policy output. So for example, a city council member might, might merge together public concerns, droughts, and rainwater, uh, rainwater harvesting knowledge that's accumulated, uh, know-how that's accumulated, um, to come up with, uh, to introduce an ordinance, um, as we have in Tucson, um, that requires uh, passive rainwater harvesting for about, uh, I think it's 40 percent of the water for irrigation in any new commercial developments in order to then adopt a rainwater harvesting ordinance. So we've got this second theory which helps us think about what might be going on in communities. Um, Socio-technical transitions theory suggests that there are regimes of mutually reinforcing elements um, that lock in beliefs about the option space that's available. You have niche innovations such as inventions and research. Um, we have long-term landscape changes such as climate change and that these things can destabilize the logic of this regime which is comprised again of mutually reinforcing um, social, uh, economic, um, cultural, and, um, um, and policy elements. Um, they also think that transitions can be fostered through what they call transition management, a collective learning process that broadens support for gradual adoption and new policies. So climate change and conservation technologies can put pressure on the existing regime, which is then destabilized and starts to um, um, adopt uh, new innovations. Um, there's a, a, th a fourth theory called punctuated equilibrium. The idea here is that there are long periods of incremental policy change, where policy is fairly stable, except their kind of existing policy um, leadership is, is kind of um, uh, uh, incrementally um, optimizing the way they currently do things, but those long periods of incremental change are interrupted by major policy change when opponents can offer a new so-called policy image in response to some kind of strong event, a vivid event, or a, an emerging, growing, worsening problem that mobilizes new actors, um, that elevates the issue uh, to broader debate where new people participate and they take the decisions out of the so-called smaller policy monopolies or issues networks that are dominating the local community or the state or the nation. So for example, drought might occasionally occur that induces conservation spending as more people um, get involved in this issue and ask questions about what should be done. California has had periodic droughts throughout its history which uh, suggests that um, makes you wonder if uh, innovation happened um, on the tail of these, um, these droughts. Um, policy diffusion um, is, is, is another theory which indicates that change comes from governments emulating policies adopted by other governments through learning about their effectiveness, through the desire to imitate their leaders, uh, that is, you know, the, 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 the most um, uh, highly respected communities um, that people start to imitate. Um, it could happen through normative pressure when all the others are doing it, then my city should do it. 
could happen when the city is looking for some kind of a competitive edge um, to make them stand out and more attractive to migrants, that is people who are relocating, to young people, to corporations looking for um, to locate jobs. Or it can also happen through coercion by more powerful governments. Diffusion theory also suggests that a state um, might force the cities by adopt, to do something by adopting a new rule. Um, you typically see an S-shape shape adoption curve characterizing this, um, which can describe dif diffusion because early on there's not so many um, others doing the policy innovation for the others to learn from, but later there are fewer left to adopt um, the, um, the innovation. Um, so in the early and the late, the adoption process is, uh, let's say, this, it's less steep. Um, there are other models, though, um, such as the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor and the regional adoption model, which we saw in part um, suggested by the uh, Vanderbilt um, and, uh, network model. But the broad idea is that they're spreading awareness of effectiveness in this model. Okay, so what then actually triggers adoption? So um, a number of us, uh, not just myself, work together to review the literature uh, on um, the, where people have studied sustainable policy innovations in water systems, in local governments. A lot of these studies in the US and um, Europe and Australia, um, pulling about uh, 40 or 50 of these papers together, the ones that are truly empir have empirical evidence behind them, um, and, and this is what we found. Um, and what we found is that uh, the work falls into three large groups. Those that focus on the governance um, of the wa uh, or the policy governance processes, those that focus on uh, external environmental forces, um, and those that focus on uh, the innovation itself. Um, uh, so, um, and let me tell you that a lot of these were done by case studies. The ones in yellow were the subjects addressed in, with, with yellow boxes around them were done by larger N um, uh, survey research kinds of uh, activities. Um, now looking at some of these in order and in, in a little bit deeper, deeper dive, the governance component um, is concerned with uh, people have found, the, um, for example, that process, um, how decision making is done can make a difference. This is where people emphasize collaboration, which can promote trust and sharing and learning and mobilization um, and experimentation, um, which I would characterize a particular form of collaboration. But um, people also recognize that these processes can be limited um, and that power, who's in charge, the dominant coalition, for example, um, makes it, has a um, you know, big effect on um, what's, uh, what's decided. Um, Meanwhile, others have noticed that individual actors can be influential. Um, I should point out, by the way, that these references here in italic um, are actually the kinds of water systems that the studies um, being addressed in this box um, actually looked at. So um, anyway, um, leadership um, ha can be crucial. Uh, actors and the kind of work that they're doing, whether it's creative or dis disruptive to induce change or so-called maintaining worth, work uh, to reinforce the way current things are done, or the attitudes of the technicians, particularly the engineers, um, or the, the role of actors from higher levels of government who might be taking on board uh, and underwriting risk, if you will, to help local governments innovate. Um, these kinds of um, um, behaviors of actors can be influential in inducing change. The, uh, another way to look at this, um, for those who've studied this, is by looking at the organization, and it's in various kind of ways, um, what its dominant form of so-called institutional logic, whether it tends to be dominated by those who have pipe-bound mental men mentality, as some of the authors put it, uh, put it, for example, or whether the organization has a commitment to an experimentation and learning and where research and innovation is embraced. Um, um, so organizational culture can be relevant. Organizational capacity refers to 
financial capacity, like the wherewithal to, to try new ideas, um, the adaptive capacity, which is um, similar to the um, culture as to the ability to learn, um, the ability to foster experimentation, um, institutional capacity, um, which has which is more of a combination of human resources development, organizational strength in, in terms of interorganizational collaboration, um, this sort of thing. But these capacities is a traditional and frequently considered um, set of drivers. But policy and law, the context, can matter as well. Um, narrow policy requirements um, can make it um, can impede progress, for example. Whereas mandates from above can both impede or, or motivate and overcome local resistance in some cases. And um, even the f governmental form, so some studies have looked at whether or not the, you have um, governments like districts as, composed, as compared to general purpose governments or um, in general purpose governments when the, whether the voting is ward voting um, um, or um, at-large voting these can influence uh, the distribution of, um, of or the uh, the the, uh, the way that the um, the deciders uh, take decisions, um, and uh, so that fragmentation, or I'm sorry, that governmental organization can matter, as can whether or not the organization essentially is public or private. In situations um, where water is private, um, water utilities are private, the observation has been made that it can lead to more innovation. They seem to be more facile, but those innovations tend to be more profit and efficiency at the expense of social and environmental objectives. Um, now, uh, the environmental innovation theories are um, uh, social, economic, and built-in natural conditions in the environment can make a difference. Whether the community knows a lot about water, the party politics in the community, the costs of the water and other, uh, well, this cost, let's say costs of water, um, the income levels, um, the demand patterns, um, whether or not the community relies on groundwater, and what it's built before are all um, elements of the environment that is outside the policy decision process itself that infuse into and influence the policy process. Um, and lastly, the innovations themselves. Oh, I'm sorry, I also left out <clears throat> the drought and the heat. These are natural environmental conditions, environmental conditions that can matter. Finally, um, whether or not the innovation is disruptive or risky can make a difference. Um, you know, people have observed that if the innovation conflicts or contradicts um, the entrenched beliefs about how one should proceed, that is, for example, decentralized solutions in a situation where utilities um, 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 are less confident in um, decentralized and more confident in centralized solutions. That that you know, an innovation that it is decentralized will have a harder go of it, as will those that um, have less attractive cost and benefit, or where there's less uncertain or less certainty about the cost and, ben and benefits as well. Um, notably, um, we found then when we compare the theoretical to the um, to the empirical studies um, by contrasting which of the theories cover the various um, uh, factors that are identified, we found that the most comprehensive was the activity coalition framework. Um, uh, so this is an illustration of that. So for example, where uh, Others have found that empirically looking at communities that, that stakeholder collaboration mattered, uh, the activity coalition framework found, finds and suggests and predicts that there can be cross coalition learning. Um, where there's a finding of leadership, the ACF suggests that principal coalition actors and policy brokers are common. Where mandates are found to have the ability to make a change the ACF suggests that hierarchically superior jurisdictions can overwhelm coalitions. Um, where uh, problem severity has been found to motivate change, the ACF has previously suggested that coalitions can exploit external crises. So it's very interesting that we now are starting to realize that there are some pre-existing theories 
um, that can be useful in explaining what's going on and sort of tie together uh, the pre-existing um, empirical literature and suggest pos possibly even um, missing elements that need to be further developed. One of those is networks. Now, networks is common to a lot of these theories. So the multiple streams theory has policy communities. The socio-technical transition theory has multi-actor networks. The AC, the activity coalitions framework, has coalitions. Punctuated equilibrium has issues networks. And policy diffusion has communication networks. So they all have an interest in networks, but they're all rather underdeveloped, I would argue, with respect to truly understanding the nature of these net networks. How do they form and learn? How do they cause or prevent change? Most importantly, how do networks foster sustainable urban water policy practices and specific mixes of those practices? For example, is it harder to change both utility management and land development practices because it involves weakly linked networks of urban planners and water managers? So when we're talking about, for example, um, um, changing um, subdivision standards to foster passive rainwater harvesting, that, invo that involves changing getting involved in two policy subsystems, both the land use policy one as well as the water um, management policy one. And these are, uh, are, are these weakly linked? They may well be, and that make it all the harder to bring about change. So how are we studying these questions? Um, I will briefly review the empirical study that we're then undertaking motivated by this understanding that I previously described. So um, uh, a number of us uh, at the University of Arizona in collaboration with other locations are working on an empirical study, um, a large N um, uh, piece of survey, empirical research, to first identify the urban water stakeholders and their functions in the five urban water innovations network um, regions. And we're using the, we started with the federal, state, and local governments um, census of governments in which we can fi identify uh, general purpose and special purpose, uh, that is utilities, um, uh, districts, and so on, that spend water on various water-related functions. We then go deeper into them, visiting their websites, and in some cases talking to them to identify um, uh, the actual lo local water um, organizations within the local water governments, if you will, the various departments, if you will, that in some way are collaborating or working or touching water issues um, in these various kind of governments. Um, we have found a lot of these governments, and we're going to be doing survey research on them. So, for example, um, in, uh, in, in the county um, th that includes the city of Baltimore, the county that includes the city of Fort Lauder Lauderdale, and so on, um, we found um, uh, you know, nearly 250 different so-called local water organizations. Now, um, we're then going to measure um, the urban water sustainability practices um, uh, under these different functional areas. Um, we're going to look at um, whether the policies are being considered, whether they're experimenting with it, implementing it, um, or have done it and have terminated it. And then we're going to specifically identify um, for each of the different um, uh, uh, practices and policies what level of these things is going on in these uh, many different communities that we'll be studying. For example, we're going to ask all the different organizations, all of these different organizations, whether they are ensuring that performance and service letters levels are equitable throughout the service areas. That's something they do. Do they reach out to underserved areas in various languages? Do they engage in low-income billing assistance? If you're interested, you can go here and actually see our survey um, where we look at, where we identify the dozens of different um, things we're going to be studying um, in that way. Um, we're then going to be also characterizing the social networks. Um, we're going to be, um, for example, asking folks um, um, who are they interacting with uh, and in what ways are they interacting. Um, and that element of the survey can be, can be observed here. So, for example, we're actually now piloting a survey in, um, in Pinal County in Arizona. Um, and we're asking folks to go to this map and identify, for example, w which other agencies do they interact with once they identify the agencies or organizations or they add them. They can be governmental, they can be non-governmental. That list pops up this way and then we ask them questions like, do they attend the same meetings? Do they seek or provide advice? 
um, do they jointly advocate for policy? This is going to help us to identify the characteristics or the nature of the interactions that occur between these folks. Um, we're then going to um, try to characterize the nature of the of the networks um, with empirical analysis um, and and start to compare whether communities are, uh, whether communities that are doing more with respect to sustainability or more with respect to certain approaches to sustainability um, have social networks that look different than those that are that are doing less. Um, for example, uh, those that are um, doing more with respect to decentralized approaches to um, or with respect to social justice approaches um, may have a social network that includes individuals representative of, of um, those, um, those areas of interest and concern. Um, we're particularly interested, we have a number of different um, you know, hypotheses and questions we're interested in here, but you know, for example, one of them is how do external factors such as whether they're collaborative insti institutions influence the network structure. Does, for example, this suggest that maybe bringing um, stakeholders together uh, to, um, uh, who, who come from different um, points of view that would be, for example, under the Advocacy Coalition Framework, um, different coalitions with different core policy beliefs about how to um, about the importance of sustainable urban water or how to approach water sustainability having them engage in collaboration bringing them together does that change their networks and do those different networks um, um, correlate with different um, um, policy adoption patterns and ultimately hopefully if we learn something that is relevant um, um, we will um, develop useful indicators for local governments. How well do you do with respect to networking? How strong is your network? Um, do you have a network that can be characterized as one that would be helpful or um, 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 uh, more resistant to um, fostering um, sustainability? Last thing I'll say is that um, we are studying these questions in a deeper way um, through case studies. Um, in addition to the large scale uh, survey research. We're doing deeper case studies and this is um, a case, some of the evidence coming from the case study of Tucson that we've been working on this last year around rain, rainwater harvesting practices, looking at who are the um, key, what are the key nodes, who are the key players involved in the adoption process that folks are connected to who are engaged in doing this kind of work. Tucson water, for example, is very important as has the city council who adopted an ordinance, particularly a certain ward um, or part of the city um, where one of the council members is from, working with this nonprofit organization called the Watershed Management Group, um, as well as certain individual activists, one of whom was just in a newspaper article this morning talking about um, rainwater harvesting and why Phoenix should be doing more, and in fact suggesting that the reason has to do with the history of drought and reliance on groundwater that um, characterizes Tucson in a way somewhat different. Um, than Phoenix. So then, um, these are the questions. What kind of sciences are needed? What sort of social science has to offer? What policies are being adopted? How do we adopt theories compared to empirical research? Why are networks important for learning and how are we approaching these? I hope I've given you a useful overview and maybe tweaked a few uh, interesting thoughts or comments. Um, I'd be interested in your um, suggestions for how to better understand these issues. I'm happy to answer any questions I might be able to answer. I'm not sure I can answer every question um, that you might come up with, but I'll do my best. Thank you. I'm sorry, I wasn't hearing anything. I'll try again. Are we unmuted? I hear you, Neil. Okay, I thought I was muted and couldn't say anything. <laughs> uh, question I had, I thought it was very interesting, uh, very comprehensive. I left a lot of, just a few thoughts as you went along, you know. Uh, different slides and um, 
what what I'm impressed by is uh, you've got a great um, view of the policy um, environment, the policy research questions, and all of that. When we get down to the nitty gritty of the water utilities, the wastewater utilities, the stormwater utilities, and, and the different things that are happening, you know, in local government um, to get them to make changes of different kinds. Everything that you presented applies to that, but it's it's kind of in a different language than they would be using when they're talking. You know, they're talking about reorganization and budgets, you know, and all the usual stuff there. Yeah. And yeah. I was just wondering if if your research was going to be presented to the um, uh, a group of stakeholders who came from this these local governments or or uh, whatever groups they would come from. <clears throat> Are there shifts you could make in the language uh, to uh, align all of these these uh, different uh, concepts to the same level of language that might be used in something like governing magazine? You know what I'm talking about. Don't yeah, you? sure. Yeah, you know, Neil, I um, I uh, think that um, first of all, I would um, imagine that they wouldn't be tolerant of um, an overview as comprehensive as this and that what we'd want to be uh, presenting you know is the lessons learned um, what we actually discover um, are you know um, the important drivers that's one thing um, because I think they're practical people not so much theoretical people um, secondly I think that uh, the language uh, can be translated um, but whether or not um, I'm the best person to do it uh, we scholars are the best people to do it or, um, or not is a fair question. You know, there is uh, literature you probably know, of course, on the um, use of science in policy. Um, and um, um, one of the things they find is that, um, you know, it's, they're very, it is really difficult. Um, um, and uh, that's the, in fact, about a year ago, National Academy of Sciences did a big project on this um, and reviewed all that literature. And, and made that point. Um, part of it is because policymakers don't necessarily want to be confused with the facts, to put it kind of simply. In the, in the, you know, um, way back in the 60s when people were doing policy analysis, they were wondering how come their findings weren't um, being followed by politicians. And it was because the politicians had more at stake um, than you know, necessarily optimizing on certain empirical considerations. But um, uh, the, one of the things this study found was that the, the incredibly important role of intermediaries, people who translate. And that's where organizations like um, the um, um, extension services come in um, or others um, and, um, and uh, like professional associations. So I would, I would um, try, but I would think it would be important to work uh, in collaboration with um, translators um, 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 who can help us uh, translate what we find into practical um, practical answer. I think that's very, very important. Yeah, I think that, that gives me an idea. I wouldn't be the one uh, to lead this kind of research, but I did follow some of that early work on policy analysis and um, the fact that it didn't really take because of um, those factors that you mentioned. But you know, the, <clears throat> the number of interest groups um, and Associations, they're not all professional associations, they, they might be called that, but um, groups like the National Water Alliance, uh, different interest groups in D.C. that are promoting uh, one interest or another. I, I think the number of them has increased vastly since the 1960s. And an interesting line of research might be to take the um, the kind of comprehensive um, understanding that we've got from all these literature reviews and run an experiment as to whether uh, a group of these associations could be recruited um, and they would be motivated to take the knowledge uh, base that comes from research uh, and figure out how to translate it into uh, packages that would be attractive and palatable to the political process so that actual change could take place. I think that'd be a very interesting project. It'd have to be applied to a particular sector like the urban water sector, 
um, could be a, a follow-on to what we're doing here or um, maybe funded through some other group or something. But anyway, from what you said, it just occurred to me that that would be extremely interesting. And you know, I think something just happened that um, on a water pollution side that shows that um, we've had such a trouble, uh, such a, a lot of trouble getting nutrient controls to work <clears throat> in three <clears throat> of these associations just announced their partnership that they're going to work on that. Uh, one of them is the National Water Alliance. I think one of them might be worth. I'm not sure of the other. But anyway, it made me think that what they're saying is, hey, all the regulation and government activity is not enough. We're going to have to kick in with more voluntary uh, cooperative activity to work on these nutrients. And so anyway, I'm, I'm just kind of brainstorming. That, that's uh, an idea for some future research. I think that's great, Neil. That's really important stuff. Well, thank you. Great webinar. Thank you. Are we the only ones on here? Um. I think Jessica might be out there. Are you out there, Jessica? I was wondering, uh, Gary, if um, if the high, it was, I was intrigued by the high per capita use in Arizona. I was wondering if everybody is sort of assigned a proportion of the cap water, like they already start. Even if I didn't use more than a liter a day in my house, am I sharing in the burden of the of the losses that come for, for transferring that water? I'm not sure I understand your question. Try it one more time. You cut out a little bit. Okay, sure. Um, why the, the high, why is Arizona why is Arizona high above the U.S. like that? Yeah, and I was thinking it might be because everyone is sort of charged a per capita use for the for the water losses of the the Central Arizona project water that's being transported, right? So if it, um, that's that, I mean. That my I don't know for sure. Um, I would my guess, Neil, you might know gallons per capita per day is probably delivered by the utilities um, rather than which is post the yeah, delivery I, of the yeah, tap water. I've got I've got a lot of data on that. Um, what is the main question about it? Is really is that is that truly per capita use at the household level? Or, or is, is it, it evaporation and so loss and leakage from cap? Is you're kind of wondering, right? This, yep. this whole business, this whole business actually turns into a very complicated water accounting uh, challenge that utilities have. I've got a, a shelf of books on that, and in order to answer the question, you have to get into the accounting method and be sure that everybody is talking about exactly the same item within there. For example, I sent a note on this. And Gary's um, figures on Tucson apparently include the outdoor water use, but it says per capita use. Just this week, I was on this uh, committee with the local Fort Collins utility, and they were reporting 70 gallons per capita per day. So I said, well, what is the difference? And they said, well, <clears throat> you, know, you know, we have factored out all of the commercial and industrial and whatever, and that's just the residential. You know, and I think Gary's includes businesses and whatever. Uh, it may or may not, but anyway. Yeah, I think it's deliveries by Tucson Water, but yes. Yeah. So you have to you have to clarify that. Yeah. So bottom line is we're not really sure, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, we definitely have uh, uh, you know this ginormous delivery system that involves a certain amount of loss in the process. And of course, it is part of the use when people live in a very dry place and they have to transport water to that dry place. Yes. I think this is really interesting. Well, thank you. You set a high bar, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it actually was an opportunity for me to pull together work I've been doing and then haven't um, pulled it all together yet. So that is. Uh, that's great, and so that makes it um, 
I can go from here now. Um, I, I find uh, and you know and, and and write some of this down. I find it really intriguing how these pre-existing theories of the policy process are um, uh, how they exist, how they seem relevant, how they have a lot of commonalities. Like a lot of them reference these net social networks. A lot of them re reference these these champions or leaders. A lot of them reference um, these um, these uh, powerful um, events that can that can stimulate change. Um, and so it does strike me that there is a need for a, a synthesis of that. And I also noticed that a lot of the literature on urban water policy, you know, change is a bit random in what in in which theory it refers to and where it pulls in its variables and what it does and doesn't include um, strikes me we could start to be more systematic about pulling together in, a, in one place um, what a lot of uh, policy studies have found is relevant and then perhaps start if we in, fa in fact do understand that champions are important or that there really are these um, political coalitions that have to be understood that way but those coalitions can um, can change their point of view through um, through certain kinds of learning processes. Then we should, um, if we know that that's true by looking at these studies, um, and it seems to hold up, then we should be, you know, teaching water professionals to understand the existence of these coalitions. Um, and um, and when I think about when we've done our engagement in UN and gone around the country and met folks, and I I think about the places and the people who are creating innovation and change, um, I really do realize um, that some of the stories in these theories seems to explain or seems to, you know, capture uh, what these um, what these leaders and innovators and champions are doing um, and how they're pulling together these coalitions and creating learning. And so I think there's something fruitful here that could be helpful to the water profession um, where we can sort of bring these policy studies and use them to start uh, to help people better understand the, the complicated social environment that they're working in where they're trying to make change. Um, I think it's now 2.03 and so if Sarah's out there I suppose we should say thank you everybody and let everyone go. Can, can you hear me? Uh-huh, just now. Oh, okay. I was wondering why I kept getting talked over because I kept trying to. Oh well, we didn't hear you until just now. I didn't hear I you until. Double, I double muted myself somehow. Um, okay, okay, there's one more question. Can we ask one final question? Sure. Yeah. Okay, this is from Jessica. Um, she wants to know if there's any sense of how much of the literature in the review couple technologies or specific policies to the context, governance, or actors, norms, or cultural factors. Um, say that again. Okay. Any sense of how much of the literature in review couple technologies or specific policies to the context, governance, or actors, norms, or cultural factors? Um, um, yeah, let me think for a second. Um, well, I, I, I can't give you a count off the top of my head, but most certainly um, one of the ideas um, that comes up in the literature, um, which is shown here on my screen, is this idea of, um, hold on, yeah, um, that the attitudes of the technicians, um, toward non-pipe solutions and their willingness to go beyond um, has shown has been shown to be these are empirical observations through case studies and that sort of thing has been shown to make a real difference in whether something is going to happen um, and there's this institutional logic approach which really comes out of sociology which um, does focus on this idea of the dominant norms in the culture of the organization and how that tends to limit or constrain the option space. So yes, indeed, um, that seems to be, you know, highly relevant. And um, a number of the um, 
a number of the theories um, emphasize norms as well. So in the advocacy coalition framework, you can have, let's say, the dominant coalition A, which might be the traditionalists, and the B might be the environmentalists. Um, and these folks have these um, these um, uh, these um, deep core beliefs um, and and norms which describe how they think um, about um, what is um, important, what's an important issue, and how best to, to go about solving that. Um, and these deep core beliefs and norms. Um, as well as um, you know more um, you know less deep and less struck less um, um, uh, less firmly planted um, they can all they're all amenable to change through this learning process that can happen um, in different ways one of the most interesting ways is the is is um, is um, um, inter coalition learning um, where they get together and learn from each other. Sometimes that can take the form of negotiation, but it tends to suggest that this research tends to suggest that it'll only happen, you know, if there's some kind of stalemate where the dominant point of view um, ha needs to, in order to get its goals achieved, um, negotiate with the other. A lot of times we don't take these details into consideration, and and um, we expect folks to work well together from different um, coalitions who aren't necessarily willing to listen all that much to each other and that uh, but that uh, the learning might therefore have to be focused on um, um, approaches that are uh, going to work for the coalition that's the dominant coalition where they learn from other places who are who they do respect and um, and wish to imitate in the, in the form of a diffusion model kind of theory so yeah most well, certainly um, uh, some of these papers have looked at these norms, um, and I'd be happy to share those um, if there's a specific interest. Excellent, Jess says thanks, and that she's looking forward to talking more about all of this. So <laughs> that was our last question, and uh, I haven't seen anything else pop up. So really good discussion, excellent presentation, Gary. Thank you for taking the time out of your afternoon, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next week for Mary's presentation. Uh, I'll send out a link to the video as soon as it's ready. You guys have a great afternoon. Thanks, Gary. Okay, thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.